Welcome to the Minnehaha County Historical Society's Monthly History Talks. Tonight, it is our pleasure to have as our presenter, aviation artist, filmmaker, and historian, John Mollison. In addition to being a presenter and publisher of history education to organizations around the world, John is the producer of the award-winning series, Old Guys and Their Airplanes. Please join me in welcoming John Mollison. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to imagine a planet. Imagine a planet far, far away. And we'll give you three more seconds. Three, two, one. Now your planet could be anything. Maybe it had red trees and a yellow sky. Maybe it was dark and cold and black. Maybe it was dry and hot. But your planet was something that you created in your mind, and everybody in this room thought of a different planet. So what I'd like you to do now is to take your planet that you created in your mind and put it in half your brain. With the other half of your brain, I'd like you to remember a photograph that everybody in this room has seen. It's the photograph that was made from the moon of Earth. 1969 was this wonderful, colorful picture of a blue-green ball with clouds that went around it. And we called it home. Now, your planet and our planet, they're both in your brain each on different sides. And I'm going to have you imagine one more thing. I'm going to have you imagine a spaceship on Earth. And we're all going to get inside this spaceship, and we're going to go to your imaginary planet. Now, we know something about science. We know that if we have a planet far away, even if we're traveling at the speed of light, which some people say is theoretically impossible, it's going to take some time. So we're going to develop a crew of people to be on our spaceships. And that crew is going to be a community. The community is going to be doctors, because we're going to have health issues. It's going to be, obviously, people who can fly the spaceship, because we need that. There's even going to be chefs. There's going to be people that we need to clean the carpets or whatever the floors are on our spaceship. So we have this community. We get inside our spaceship, and we're now going to your planet. And we get off, and we move on our way, and we arrive. Now, we have just traveled the entire galaxy, and we're now at your new planet, I'm going to tell you that there's going to be an awful lot alike on your planet as it was the Earth that we left. Even all the diversity in our minds right now in this room, there is more alike on your imaginary world with Earth than you might have thought. Let me tell you what's alike. First of all, on your new world, 2 plus 2 will equal 4. Mathematics is going to be the same everywhere in the universe. Another thing, a carbon atom, an oxygen atom, a uranium atom on Earth is going to be the same on your spaceship as on your new world, too. And the physics that we had to overcome or manage, whatever it was on Earth, we had to do the same thing in our spaceship to get to your new world. It's pretty straightforward to think about the science, the technology, the engineering, and the mathematics it takes to move worlds. But I want you to think about something else. Now let's just say we're on this spaceship, and it's going to take us months, maybe years, to make our journey. How long do you think it would be? Let's just say we left tomorrow. How long do you think it would be in our community, let's just say there's 100 people, for somebody to walk down to the cafeteria and announce something like this? 
You know, the situation in Ukraine, we wouldn't have it if Trump were elected. And then how long do you think it would take for somebody in the room to go, you are absolutely crazy. And in a second, we would have a fight. And in a second, we'd have factions and factions and factions. My name is John Mollison. I'm an aviation artist. I'm a writer. I'm a filmmaker. And it is a real honor to be here at the Minnehaha County uh, Historical Society. This is so freaking cool to be in this, all this history. But, you know, one thing I've learned in life, interviewing old people, I tell them I interview old guys and I draw their airplanes, specifically people who've been in the crucible of war. I've learned something talking to people who go out and experience history, experience conflict, certainly a lot bigger and deeper than maybe we're having in our spaceship about politics. But I've learned something about how age works and wisdom works. I've learned something about how people work. I've learned that science, technology, engineering, and math, and you've heard, me, heard this phrase before, STEM, is pretty straightforward. Now, maybe not all of us have the head for organic chemistry. Maybe not all of us have the head for advanced mathematics. I certainly, I don't. But science, technology, engineering, and math is fairly straightforward stuff. It's universal. But when I talk to old people who've experienced the crucible of combat, and they've come back, raised a family, raised a business, had kids, maybe had a kid, didn't turn out so well. Maybe didn't have a marriage turned out. Maybe everything went great. That is the story of people. That is the story of sociology, the story of civics, the story of history. I like to tell people I'm a history geek. History geeks tell the story of us. Science, technology, engineering, and math tell the story of what we do with us. Well, that's my side of why I get passionate about what I do. But when Rick Lingberg asked me to come and speak, he, uh, he asked me what I've got going on. And I, I told him, I said, well, Rick, you know, we're, I'm working on a project right now that we hope will help tell history in a better way in a more efficient way. Because teaching history, telling history, sharing history is hard work. We get on our little spaceship and we imagine the conflicts we have. Think about today, the conflicts we have amongst ourselves with our different opinions, our different ideas. That's why teaching history is so, uh, is so challenging. You know, as a sidebar, I want to wanna give you a little anecdote. Did you know the average high school student in South Dakota, and this is certainly no indictment against teachers. Teachers right now are working twice as hard as they ever have been to do the same amount of work. They have so many pressures. But the average history teacher will spend 22 minutes on the Vietnam War. I want you to think about that. 22 minutes on the Vietnam War. And I can make a pretty good case that the Vietnam War has affected American culture, American politics, American entertainment, more so even than World War II. And yet, 22 minutes. And this is 22 minutes to people who will soon go out into the world and be chefs, vacuum carpets, be doctors, be politicians. And I think everybody here in the back of their head has an opinion on the Vietnam War. Wouldn't you want to know, wouldn't you want to know that our youth of today are going out into the world equipped to understand this powerful force in our history, let alone how our nation even started? Well, teaching history is hard work, and it's complicated. So we need to work harder, and we need to think, how do we engage people with history? How do we engage people to open up their brains to go, that's where I came from. That's my story. That can help me make a better person or affect my world in, in more positive ways. 
Okay, so if I can get Rick to put up a little slide, I want to show you something. We're going to talk about something that I've been working on that I think helps explain why history is so important and how we need to go the extra mile, sometimes the, the extra dollar, to, to learn its lessons. Okay, what you're seeing on screen up there is a silver World War II bomber. It's called a B-25 Mitchell. And if you look underneath it, you'll see a logo that has the state of South Dakota and some stars. And underneath it's RAID 22. RAID across South Dakota 2022. We're heading to the Ellsworth Air Show. Now, I'll get to this in a minute. Why is the B-25 important? Just hang with me a little bit. But I'll explain what's going to happen on May 9th of this year. That B-25, that particular B-25, is going to land here in Sioux Falls. And if you can imagine what it's like to come out onto the, the ramp of a, of a runway at an airport, and by the way, y'all are invited, and you see this loud, if you've ever seen a World War II airplane taxiing up and the engines, they cough and they splatter and they rattle, and it comes up in taxis, the engines shut down, the belly opens up, people come down, and then a crowd of history teachers and students and VIPs and yourselves can come up and actually put your hand on, a, on an important part of not only American history, but South Dakota history. And I'm going to explain that in a second. But we're going to start here in Sioux Falls. And then we're going to fly to Brookings. And then we're going to fly to Aberdeen. We're going to overnight in Aberdeen. And then we fly to Chamberlain. And then we fly to Rosebud. And then we fly to Pier overnight. And then go to Rapid City. And then end up at the Ellsworth Air Force Base Air Show. So you might be thinking, uh, why are you guys doing this? Well, first of all, the Ellsworth Air Show is contained in Rapid City. It's a wonderful celebration of something about South Dakota that very few people understand the depth and the breadth of how important it is for our state to have Ellsworth. It's a huge employer. I believe it's the number two employer in the state. And yet, it's also an important part of our culture, our history, and our nation's defense. But not everybody can go drive to Rapid City. So what we decided to do was we were going to bring a little bit of the air show to the communities around the state. And believe me, raising money for this is no problem. And I want to tell you why. is because people are starting to get the importance of teaching history. We have been teaching STEM very well. It is now time to start teaching our stories our culture, and where we came from. And then thinking through, what does it mean for us to use the lessons of the past and make a better future? So imagine that we're going to be landing this airplane. Two things are going to happen. The first thing is, is we're going to be filming a documentary. Now, uh, we did the raid across South Dakota in 2019 as well. And I want to tell you what happened. I was very fortunate. I got to ride along and, and be a part of it, part of it then as now. And when we would come up to, in these towns and get out of the airplane, it was, it, it, was, it was amazing how the community would just glom around this ancient artifact. I, I remember a time in Mitchell. We landed. The weather was terrible. It was, it was rainy. It was cold. But there was a woman with a little kid and another in a stroller and she came up, and, and uh, she was just heading to the, to the bomber, and she had a, a look of wide-eyed appreciation. And I just asked her, I said, you know, geez, you're bringing your kid out in the cold weather? And she said, well, we have to be here. And I said, why do you have to be out in this weather? I mean, I love airplanes, but I think you're nuts. And she said, no, my grandfather was a mechanic on one of these airplanes, and I've never seen one. If you don't think that we didn't change a life somehow, some way by connecting with this person with their past, we did. Or I can give you another example. We landed in Pier. Now, the Pier Airport is gorgeous. It's a beautiful example of architecture and all this good stuff. And we're taxiing in, clack, 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 turned around, and there was nobody on the ramp. And we thought, this is a bust. And I remember being in the airplane, and I heard the pilot. Now, a B-25 is extremely loud, but I remember hearing the pilot over the intercom say, oh, my God. 
And I looked out, and there in this beautiful architecture, large windows, were just faces and hands and faces and hands stuck to the window, almost like they were standing climbing on top of each other. We shut the engines down, a door opened, a head popped out. Can we come out? We had 600 people immediately around that airplane. We're going to be filming these people and talking to them. What does it mean for you to be a South Dakotan? What does it mean for you to have heritage? What does it mean for you to know that this B-25 is connected to your heritage? And I'll get to that in a second. But we're going to be filming this film, and South Dakota Public Broadcasting has agreed that they'll give us prime real estate in November to air the film. You'll all get a chance to see it. We're also going to have premieres in these communities sometime before. That'll happen in November. We'll be filming. But what about now? What are we going to do to make the moment now? Well, if I can get you, Rick, to go to the next slide. We've had a, a, a challenge when you, um, go, there you go. We have a challenge in creating educational materials. You know, how, what does it look like? How do you get people captivated? I mean, you all have a cell phone, right? I mean, I can look at mine over there, but we all know what it means to walk around with a cell phone. Well, we had some success with an educator's kit on RAID across South Dakota 19. And the idea was we wanted to give people a chance to have some take-home material, specifically history teachers and specifically the, the students, as well as everybody else. I mean, if you all show up on the, on the 9th in Sioux Falls, you all get one. But what we wanted to do was make something relevant. Names, dates, and places, just the numbers, the quantitative data, the stem of history, you know, Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. It's a great little rhyme. It doesn't tell you anything. We wanted to make the focus on the character and the values of people in South Dakota, ordinary people in South Dakota, who did extraordinary things. Don't we want to motivate our youth? Don't we want to even motivate ourselves? So, Rick, I can, I can get you to flip through. And by the way, what you're seeing here is preview. Uh, it's, we're still in production, and we go to press actually in 10 days. These thing, this thing is going to take 30 days to build. But when you flip this up, the design we got was from a World War II, actually late 40s field manual. And it's the size of a phone, and I'll get to why that's important in a second. But you flip it up, and the first page you see, I want you to look at this. The headline is, they were challenging moments during dark times. South Dakotans climbed ahead anyway. Now, I would say that most people, you've, not, you've seen the picture of Earth, but most people have also seen that picture of that airplane flying off the carrier. Now, there's something very special about that airplane. South Dakota is on that airplane. That is the very first B-25 bomber off the carrier Hornet, April 18th, 1942. None of us were alive back then. But you have to remember, that was four months after the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor. And the United States had been experiencing defeat after defeat after defeat after defeat. Jimmy Doolittle was a general, and he was a famous air racer and a personality in his late 40s, led the first retaliatory strike against Japan. The plan went wrong from the get-go. But that airplane, that's the first B-25 off the carrier. Jimmy Doolittle, the old man of 48, 49, something like that, was in the pilot's seat. Dick Cole was the co-pilot. Right behind them in the navigator's spot was a guy by the name of Hank Potter from Pier. That moment ties us to World War II in an incredible way. So Rick, if I can get you to jump ahead. When you flip the page, we're going to be telling the stories of South Dakotans. Some of them have had incredible moments in history. Some of them that we know from those photos, like Don Smith and Hank Potter. There's, if you see this, if you can imagine this, you're pretty good at imagining because we've already been imagining planets, right? We can imagine a brochure. But when you flip it up, we've got the two drawings of both B-25s, and we've got a little bit of pictures uh, and some copy. But the headline, when you flip and you read about, about Potter and uh, Smith, 
For Smith and Potter, the Doolittle Raid was a one-way mission for greater good. And we want to ask the question, what's so important that you'd risk it all to achieve? What we want to do is we want to encourage people to think about their values, think about their character in a non-political way, a non-biased way. We don't care if somebody likes Trump or whatever. What we're trying to do is get people to think and imagine history in its real, real aspects. History is the story of us. It's the story of our soul. It's the story of how we interact. So Rick, if I can get a, a, a page. Now, I got to tell you as a sidebar, it's an anecdote, and Rick's going to advance to the next page here. But uh, over the years, I've been very privileged to meet some incredible people. And before they died, I was able to have somewhat of a relationship with Joe Foss. You've all heard of Joe Foss. I mean, he's, you know, NRA, president of NRA. He's an ace, 26 airplanes shot down, Medal of Honor. Joe Foss, if you ever met the guy, I mean, you feel like you could put a cape on him and he'd be a superhero. Well, he became one of my heroes. I got one of the last interviews with him. But I also want to tell you about another South Dakota hero that I got to know that you couldn't have gotten more different. George McGovern. I remember when I was a little kid, I could barely, you know, reach up to turn off the TV that the Vietnam War was on. Well, I couldn't say the GD word because I did once and I got my mouth washed out for, with soap. But my mother did let me say George McGovern if I ever stubbed my toe or something like that. That tells you what kind of house I grew up in. So it was really interesting. Years later, I'm sitting here getting to know George McGovern. And I tell him, I said, you know, George, my mom's dead, but she, uh, she's got to be flipping in her grave that I'm here having a drink with you. And he says, John, let me tell you how times change. He reaches into his coat pulls out his old Nokia cell phone, you know, kind of with the blue gray screens. You all had them. He goes, let's talk to my new best friend. Pushed, pushed a couple buttons and slid it across. And as it's ringing, it's Bob Dole. I've had great privilege meeting these great, great men, icons of history. But Rick, if I can get that to come al uh, alive one more time. We're also going to be talking about in this manual people that are the everyday gentleman next door. How many of you have heard of Wade Hubbard? Okay, well, one. We got from Pierre. Well, Wade Hubbard is South Dakota, too. Wade Hubbard was washed out of pilot training in the Air Force. He wouldn't give up on his dream, so he went, and whereas a lot of guys would go, you know what, I'm not going to take anything less. I'll get out of the Air Force, or I'll quit, or whatever. Wade said, you know what, I, I really want to be around airplanes. I'll take number two. Teach me to be a navigator. And Wade went off and, well, not only did, was he awarded the DFC, and I encourage you to look up the DFC. He, he wasn't awarded one. He wasn't awarded two. He wasn't awarded three. He wasn't awarded four. He was awarded five. He also had a purple heart. He bailed out, and he had to be rescued out of Cambodia. And then Wade Hubbard went back to South Dakota, to serve. We're going to be telling his story, as well as others like John Waldron, Royce Williams. The bottom line is, is we're going to be handing this, this out to teachers and students to get them to understand that we, you know, you've heard that phrase, we stand on the shoulders of giants. Well, what we do, and when we realize that, we're awfully careful about who we're standing on. But at the same time, we're also aware that the shoulders that we're standing on are allowing us to reach higher. Well, I've, I, I've got some, uh, uh, maybe I want to give you a chance to ask questions. But there a, a, was a, a gentleman that I got to meet uh, two years ago, and South Dakota Public Broadcasting helped me with this. And so did Rick, by the way. Rick played a huge role in making this happen. And we... Um, we got to interview a gentleman by the name of uh, Charles McGee. I don't know if you've heard of Charles McGee, but I'm sure you've heard of the Tuskegee Airmen, the African-American guys who in World War II, for whatever reason, they couldn't mix with the white guys, so we had to create a squadron for them. Well, Charles McGee, at 101, he was still running his own Zoom. We couldn't go out and talk to him because COVID was in rare, rare form. 
but it's amazing. This 101 year old guy, he ran his own zoom, ran his own technology. It was, it was wonderful. And when we went live on the interview, what did we have, Rick? Was it like 14,000 people like instantaneously? Well, my passion for history is such that I just don't want to meet somebody once. I'd been getting to know General McGee for some time before that. And when I first called him up and asked him if he wouldn't mind me interviewing him, it was, it was really during the after effects of the, the Floyd thing up in Minneapolis. Racial tensions were high. And actually, General McGee was getting asked to be interviewed by a lot of people, and he was turning them down. He told me, he said, John, I understand why you want to talk to a black man, especially about a black man who did good, came out of, you know, civil rights. And he said, but I want you to know that the, the real reason I became successful, the stuff that made me achieve, it's common to everybody. And if you want to talk about that, I'll talk about that. But that's what our interview will be about. I'm not going to have any ax to grind. I'm not going to have any agenda. We're going to talk about what makes every American successful. And to me, I think that's the power of history. That's the power of reading the stories and learning the stories of us. I think about STEM. STEM's great. I didn't mean to trash the math teacher or anything like that. It can get us from a planet to another planet. But can it make us get along on the spaceship? Does it give us any kind of understanding? Well, I think it's time to, to give history its, its greater due. Dig into it. Value it higher. So I asked General McGee the question. I said, well, okay, so help me articulate what you're trying to tell me about whatever made you successful is going to make me successful. And his statement was, John, if you look at yourself, how you treat yourself is how you're going to treat your family, the people in your home. And how you treat your family, the people in your home, is going to be how you treat your neighborhood. And how you treat your neighborhood is going to be how you treat your state. And how you treat your state is going to be how you treat your country. And there's a whole world out there that are looking for ways maybe to, to work with you, maybe to harm you. And you'd better be whole when you go out to the world. I remember that. You know, I get to hang out with these people and I, I tease my wife. I'm unemployable. I've been working with and living with and talking with some of the greatest leaders, men, women of all walks life. And it's made my life incredibly rich. And I try to think, how do I express that? So I have a pat phrase, and I'm going to leave you with this. I want you to think about it because I'm going to ask you to do something. But I've got a little phrase that I say, and if you go to my website, you'll see it somewhere. History is nutritious. Just think about that. You'll never forget the phrase, by the way. History, our stories, our legends, are the things that we learn, they feed us. And we need to be replenished. Sometimes we eat too much of the wrong stuff. Sometimes we don't get enough. But we need it to live, to think, to mind. And the thing I'm going to ask you to do is you now know that right across South Dakota is coming this May, May 9th, May 10th, May 11th. You know that the Ellsworth Air Force Base is having an air show it doesn't take anything for you to go and go into Google, type in Ellsworth Air Force, but you can go to the website and go to Facebook. You can find it in two seconds. You're all smart. But what I want you to do is I want to think about somebody in your life. Maybe it's a history teacher. Maybe it's a, you know, one of your kids, one of your friends. Or maybe it's somebody in your life, your greater sphere. I want you to think about somebody who you believe could be fed by history. Because I know something came, somebody came to mind. When I told you that airplane's going to be in Sioux Falls, I know somebody, you, you thought, you know who would really like to see that? It's my husband's best friend. Or my, my daughter. She loves machines. I know somebody came to mind. But over the next weeks, 
do us a favor, do yourself a favor, and do that other person a favor, and spread the word. Spread the word not only about RAID, but spread the word also that history is nutritious, and spread the word that the promise that we have in this state is just terrific, great stories, and they're being told. Thank you for letting me present tonight.